Before I expound on why God is not a Democrat, I want to share with you my experience of being up here last Sunday when Dr. Church was speaking to this congregation with great courage and dignity about his impending death. I still believe I've got the best seat in the house, because not only because it's more comfortable than those pews, <laughs> but also because I get to see everybody's faces, and I got to see the, the tears in your eyes, and I got to thinking about all the, the different situations that we've been through together over so many years, all the, all the highs and victories and celebrations and all the lows and the losses, and I was deeply moved by the integrity with which this congregation seeks to live a life of religious purpose and meaning and to hold one another through whatever happens. And I realized what a blessing it is to be the minister of this church and to be a part of this community, a real community. And I know as the events unfolded this weekend with Isaac, one of the beloved youth of this congregation that I knew and I thought of last Sunday and looking out and seeing these people and I knew that that we would be able to hold the Peralt family, Lisa and Jim and Bethany and I knew that we'd be able to carry them through this loss and one another and for me that in itself is a true blessing and I want to thank you So I've been thinking all week about which party Jesus would join if he were an American today. <laughs> Some people think they know. <laughs> For example, we received an angry phone call in the office this week, apparently from an irate Episcopalian who evidently thinks God is a Democrat. <laughs> I was glad it was just an irate Episcopalian. <laughs> it's not so scary. <laughs> In her book, Red and Blue God, Black and Blue Church, author Becky Garrison writes, even though Christians talk about following the will of Christ, if he were on the ballot today, would we vote for him? Well, for starters, his message is geared toward those undesirables who probably aren't even registered to vote. Also, that business of separating the sheep who are eligible to vote for Christ from the hordes of unregistered goats represents a pollster's nightmare. And they're having a hard enough time this year. And let's face it, Jesus can't spin worth a darn. <laughs> he tells it like it is and doesn't give a rip whom he offends. How can you have a presidential candidate, she writes, who can't even be trusted to go to a fundraising breakfast and behave in front of those all-important special interest groups needed to finance the cost of mounting a presidential campaign? And now let's examine his staff. His campaign manager looks like one of those crazy homeless guys that I see preaching in Times Square. And his female companion has a checkered past that would make Monica Lewinsky blush. <laughs> he hangs out with tax collectors, drunkards, and a host of unsavory characters. And last but not least, his trusted disciples, the guys he appointed to key leadership positions, make snafus almost every time they accompany their leader in public. Imagine this, he can't even get any respect in his own hometown. Sort of like Al Gore in 2000. 
No, if Jesus stepped into the Republican National Committee headquarters or the Democratic National Committee headquarters, both Karl Rove and Democratic head honcho Howard Dean would show him the door for sure. There's no way that they'd even remotely consider his candidacy as leader of the free world. But then again, Jesus made it clear that his kingdom lay elsewhere. End quote. And while members of both parties would love to claim Jesus or God as one of their own, doing so, to put it politely, is blasphemous. As Dr. Church made evidently clear in his talk last Sunday night, any time in American history when we see a religion hitching its star to the wagon of a particular party, it's bad for the state and it's usually even worse for the church. Last week, my son, who's in first grade, came home from school, and he exclaimed, Obama's a Democrat, but Democrats don't believe in the Bible. <laughs> a fallacious fact he apparently picked up about American politics while at school. At one time or another, most of us have seen the bumper stickers that were distributed by Jerry Falwell's followers that said, Vote Christian. And people who have these stickers are very clear what they mean. For them, to vote Christian means to vote against abortion, stem cell research, gay marriage, and a small host of other controversial issues. None of which, by the way, were ever mentioned by Jesus. And none of them can be found anywhere in the Christian scriptures. Nevertheless, each election season over the past two decades, certain evangelical churches hand out voters' guides that rate the candidates based on their positions on these specific issues. They've come to be known as wedge issues because they serve to create a wedge that divides up the electorate. The proponents of these wedge issues portray this as a battle between people of faith and their enemies. Politicians know that if they vote for these wedge issues, they will get the support of the religious right. And if they vote against them, they must face their opposition. In the past several years, we've seen laws written based on these values. We've seen Supreme Court justices appointed based on these values. And we've seen presidential campaigns advanced and collapsed based on these values. Yet the only real value in such things as opposition to gay marriage or proposition for religious displays in public places is to create division in America. In a time when health care costs are crippling, international terrorism is spreading fear and violence, public education is failing, hunger, homelessness, and drug addiction number into the millions, the environment is in crisis, and the dominant role that religion is playing in American politics is to split apart the American people using wedge issues 